Away we go. I'm about 20 seconds early, I think. Logistics, short and sweet, not much has changed. Um, I didn't have a logistics slide on Thursday, so uh, I did release project three grades or report grades. In case you notice that. Can't imagine how you couldn't notice it since I think both GradeScope and Canvas send out emails and whatnot. I have to admit, I haven't really looked to see how people are doing in terms of grades in the class. So you tell me, well, you're still here. Today, uh, the other thing that isn't on this slide, but I will mention, is that they extended the um, drop date to today. So you have through midnight tonight to drop without filing extra paperwork. And in case you're unaware, like it matters at this point, you're all done. Um, in case you're not aware, you can always actually withdraw after the withdrawal date. You just have to get permission. But amazingly enough, universities seem to be really good at always having an exception mechanism. That's different than corporate America or corporate Canada, which is for all intents and purposes the same thing, where large corporations often have no, no flexibility. You're just stuck. All right. Uh, nothing really changed, nothing's changed, nothing's changed. Don't need to spend much time on that. Um, I mentioned, I just added that last link on there, which is to um, the PLA Plus specification for Fast Paxos that uh, Heidi Howard and her co-authors put together. We're going to be talking about TLA Plus today. This is a little bit different than what we've been talking about up to this point. Up to this point, we've been talking about the same algorithm in like different sets of clothing. And I, I find, for me, that is one of the most amazing things about going through all these papers and holding them up side by side and going, wow, we just keep explaining the same thing over and over again with different terminology and in diff with different pictures to try and confuse you. And then I said, I wonder about blockchain. And I was like, yeah, it's just Paxos all over again, isn't it? You don't have to read any of those papers or look at that code, but they are all actually very useful. So we, we're far enough into Project 4 now, and I've heard enough people complaining about the challenges of it, and enough people crowing because they're done and can now go off and do other things for other courses they're taking, that you can probably begin to realize that, yes, it, it's not that hard a protocol. We can sit there, we can draw it all in a, in a nice little picture in a diagram and basically walk you through that and say, this is what's happening. And then you get into the, the actual implementation and you go, this is like Go. The rules are really simple. You can teach it to a child and you can spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how to actually make it efficient. And one of the problems with this is it is very hard for us to think about things that happen asynchronously. We've been talking about distributed systems, but in fact, almost everything we talk about in this course also applies to concurrent systems in general. I'm constantly amazed when I look at distributed systems and go, they just look like multiprocessor computers. It's many of the exact same issues. The way we build large single Single computers is by building distributed systems. They send messages to each other. They can be out of phase. They can reorder things. They have variable uh, sequences in which things can occur, and you have to reason about them all. And we do lots of crazy stuff like caching and, and, and um, so on and so forth. And so many of the things we are talking about here will happen even in single computer systems these days. Because effectively, all the computers we work with, probably your phone at this point, uh, it has multiple cores. And thus, it has multiple of what they call pro processes in the original Paxos. And they're communicating with each other. The one thing that usually makes us reason about these a little bit differently is they are fate shared. So if the power goes out on your phone, it goes out for all the cores, not just one of them. And that makes it a little bit easier. So we don't have quite the same fault model. Here we have a much more complex fault model. So how do we actually guarantee that what we think we are building works? 
That's what we're going to be talking about today. Anybody have any questions, observations? Very short and simple. And to the point, I picked an XKCD. What are you working on? Trying to fix the problems I created when I tried to fix the problems I created when I tried to fix the problems I created when? Yep. Been there, done that. At some point, you realize your model's broken. And that's usually when you say things that um, you wouldn't want your mother to hear. And you go back and rework your model. And that's not a fun thing to do. It's not fun to say, my model is wrong. The way I've been viewing this problem is wrong. And it will happen to you over and over again if you actually do almost any kind of systems building. It definitely happens in distributed systems. What makes it hard for us? We don't have a good model. I mean, a lot of why I talk these things over and over again is because I'm trying to help you build a mental model. Because without that mental model, it's a bitch when you sit down in front of the keyboard and start trying to type things in there and get them to do anything reasonable. I've talked about failure because that's what makes this an interesting area. We actually are trying to tolerate failure and mask that failure from visibility to other services that depend on us. You know, we have these client things in all of these models, the ones that originally try to do the, the key value operations that, that we use over and over again. And they are our clients. And as far as we are concerned, we don't want them to ever see that anything goes wrong, even though we know that's not possible. As much as we can, we try to make internal failures that are transient or recoverable invisible to them. Um, over the weekend, there was a discussion about ordering reads relative to, to your log. And somebody said, well, you know, the, the client comes in and they do a read, and I just pull whatever's in the key value store there, and I give it back to them. And it's like, well, okay. But you can't just simply give them the value that's there if there are changes in your log. You have to serialize that operation relative to what's going on in the log. If you don't have any proposals for anything to change, you don't have to do anything there. But if you have a proposal to change the thing they're trying to read, guess what? You're going to have to wait until that decision is made. Otherwise, you're not going to give back a consistent answer. Because I might ask you, and you're going to oh, it's 6. And you go, it's 49. So reads, we've talked a lot about mutations, about writes, but reads also have to be consistent. Um, it is so easy to sit there and to say, everything happened in this order. And then you start looking at these search tools and you realize there's lots of different orders things happen in. And it's hard for us to reason about that. Um, yeah, you can. I can sit here and hand wave this thing about. Oh yeah, you know we have isomorphic orders of operations. Blah blah blah. You go. Yeah, right. But what order did it really happen in? Guess what? It happened in one order for you, and it happened in a different order for you. And the whole reason we have this protocol is because we have to agree to some actual canonical order that we apply these changes in. It's really easy to see that when. You're changing one key and you're changing another key. We don't have to worry about them. They don't conflict. They don't collide. But if we're changing the same key, then we get that conflict. And we have to start reasoning about that. And we have to create this linearity. So in fact, what I've just said is linearity isn't always going to be achieved. And that's why it's a challenge and a source of, of failure in our model or our thinking. The biggest mistakes that I see, people overlook the source of errors. It's hard when you're actually sitting there developing real systems and going, what all could possibly go wrong? And I pull these weird examples of failure. You know, oh, gee, somebody didn't size the plumbing right, so it overflowed the water into the data center, and the whole data center melted down. These aren't imaginary failures. They're real failures. Did you ever even imagine things could fail that way? We've assumed that there are certain kinds of failures that just aren't going to happen, and we are going to find out they do. People lie, whether it's malicious or 
coincidental, they lie. And that's going to be the next big challenge we're going to have to face once we stop talking about Paxos, which is real soon. We're going to be talking about what happens when messages are corrupted, whether that corruption is deliberate or accidental. Writing code before you have a model. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and so you have to sit down and start standing something up, and you try it. And you should pretty much figure you're going to have to throw that away. And then you're going to get in the real world where you're going to work for some company. You're going to put a prototype together. You're going to go, this thing is a piece of crap. And they're going to say, great, let's ship it. And you're going to spend 10 years of your life paying for the technical debt that comes with that. And you will see it over and over again. It happens a lot. You're almost never allowed to rewrite code in the real world. Change jobs. Once you know how to do it, go to your startup company. And you can sell it and become fabulously wealthy and go sit on a beach someplace. Or not. You could be one of those people who becomes obsessed and creates more startup companies. Not using validation tools is a big mistake. If you have validation tools you can actually use, use them. They can be formal, like we're going to be talking about today, but many of the validation tools that we use are informal, like tests. Some of the easiest code I've ever developed is where I'm sitting there building tests at the same time I'm writing the code. This is what I expected to do, run the code. Damn, it doesn't do that. Is the test broken? Is the code broken? I don't know. The hardest part is I take those tests, I give them to you, and you run them, and all you have is your code, and you're going to automatically blame the tests. You know how many times I've had students tell me that it's a compiler bug? Do you know how many times it actually is a compiler bug? Do you know what the hardest part about that is? When it actually is a compiler bug and you've been doing this for long enough, you will spend way more time figuring out what the compiler bug actually is. Because the first thing you assume is not, oh, it's a compiler bug. The first thing you assume is, it's a bug in my code. So you're going to use these tools, and they're going to be buggy. Not all of them are going to be formal, verifiable tools like we're going to be talking about today. And even your formal verifier could have bugs in it. But you use these tools because they improve the outcome because they help you reason about the failures you didn't even know could happen. So, you know, talk about search space problems, right? What is a search thing doing? Well, it's trying all the possible different permutations that it could. Like, you're not going to be able to do that yourself, so using a tool to do that helps you and it improves the quality of what you produce. Um, never assume your testing is adequate. It's kind of the minimum bar. If you can come up with a test that, that finds a bug, OK, great. But someone else will be able to come up with tests that find bugs too. We're going to be talking about formal verification. And I'm specifically going to describe something called TLA+, which was invented by this guy named, you probably never heard the name before, Leslie Lamport. So he gave us um, a typesetting macro package on top of a very interesting typesetting language. So if you've used LaTeX, that's Lamport. Uh, he gave us uh, monotonic increasing sequence numbers, Lamport clocks. He gave us uh, this crazy ass Greek parliamentary distributed legislative system. He gave us Paxos. Um, and he gave us TLA+. Plus. And if you go dig, you'll find out that he gave us other things too. And he's still working. And he's older than I am, and that's saying something. All right, so what is the first thing you have to do when you want to do formal verification? You need to create a formal model of your, your, your system of interest. Hardware people actually use formal verification techniques. When you look at hardware specifications, they are usually state machine specifications. We like state machine specifications because they're very easy for us to reason about. Protocols are almost always, these days, formally described. Again, yeah, it allows us to do verification of them. Uh, how a computer bus works. You know, the PCIe 5 is actually now in production. People actually use this bus. 
They took a long time. It takes years and years and years for these things to become formalized because we have to specify it. We have to have a model for it, and we have to verify that that model actually works, right? The downside to this is that often we can't actually do a full formal verification of a complex specification. And that's because we get state space explosion. And so we can never actually prove that there aren't complex failure cases within it. In software, mostly we worry about concurrent software in terms of formal verification. Um, it doesn't typically require a huge amount of reasoning when you have something that's linear. Load this from a file, add this value, write it back. OK, how are you going to model that one and prove it? There's no variation there. There's no, we don't have multiple splitting paths. There's not much to reason about. So it becomes interesting when there's lots of potential different paths to the answer, and we want to reason about those. Um, the slides are all based on the little tiny source link there. I am not a formal verification person, but I do think this is really important. Um, I've played with TLA+. Plus. It's actually very interesting. You see, so, so what do we do? So we've got a model. Now we actually create um, a specification, which includes things like, what are the properties of our system? What are we trying to guarantee that this can do? What are the guarantees we want to give our client? What are our ground truths? These are typically invariants. I, and, and I think about this and I go, you know, even when I write code, and I've written systems code for a long, long time, one of the things that I got into a habit of doing very early on was asserting. At this point, if I'm in this state, this must be true. Because if it's not true, I want to know so I can go figure out why my model is wrong. That's what invariants are useful for in the real world. When we model things, we're going to use invariants in order to say, at this point, this must be the state of the machine. If it's not, then we have violated our invariants and we have a bug in our model. Now you validate your model, and the best part is somebody else has written a program that will take a formal verification written in a specification language and validate your model. Does it conform to your requirements? Are your invariants obeyed? When we start trying to do things like search, searching state spaces, we can't always be exhaustive about it. We're not always going to be able to test every possible permutation of every possible order. So there are limitations to what we can actually do here. In model checking, which is a particular technique of formal verification that we will actually be talking about because that's going to lead us into TLA+. There are other ways of doing formal verification. You can actually use symbolic logic and describe things and run them through proof checkers and whatnot. In model checking, what we're actually doing is specifying our model via formulas. And it's the collection of those formulas and our state machine that create the model. This is just the way that we describe our model to our model checker. Um, Ivan Beschaznik, who has, t has been teaching this class for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, actually does a lot more work in formal verification. And he didn't actually have any slides on formal verification in his class, which I thought was interesting. Um, but he, has, he still has students that take TLA plus specifications and generate Go code from them. So, um, we say that M entails phi means that if one of those is true, the other one is true. So the idea here is that if we have our, our formulas and they are true, then our interpretation is true and vice versa. So this is if and only if, in essence. And this is what we're doing when we do model checking. Create the model, and then we, we, we formalize our specification of that. And then if, if what we have described 
is, is true, it actually works, then our model actually works. This is our inference engine. So, if I have a fixed set of formulae, uh, and our model, God, I can't even remember the term again, um, entails, entails. Our model entails our, our formula, our, then are our formula value, valid? Well, maybe, but we might have we might have a broken model, in which case then our formula to describe the broken model might um, entail each other, but that doesn't mean that we're right. So we can actually use uh, more sophisticated tools to prove that our formula, our axiomatic system, is actually consistent, that we've reasoned about this correctly, and I have never actually... I will admit this never actually used a, a um, theorem prover. They didn't. We didn't actually have them when I was undergrad. I mean, we they made us prove theorems. I was a math major, so we did lots of lots of theorems and proofs and whatnot. And but that it wasn't automated yet. And now we actually have automated tools that will allow you to describe your system, and it will go through and it will verify that your system is correct. They actually kind of crazily enough do this. This is a little bit of an overkill for programs, but the, the basic idea is exactly the same. Um, let's see, so if we have some fixed set of formulas and an interpretation and um, Oh, I can't remember the word entails. Uh, M entails phi. Then uh, for some M, uh, then it means that we can satisfy our formula. So in other words, there is a model that satisfies these. That doesn't mean that all models have to satisfy those. I guess this is the flip side of it. If you come up with a model and it doesn't satisfy your formulas, then um, it's not, they don't entail each other. You can't reason about them that way. Uh, let's see. <laughs> the next one is, okay, so if we have a class of models, then how do we find formulae that actually entail the models? And now it becomes a research question, and you can go get your PhD um, on identifying a few of those. So this is a really wide open kind of open-ended, how do I actually find models to fit formulae? And that one makes my head hurt, so I'm going to keep going. Um, and if I have a fixed model and a single set of formulae, Can I prove that the uh, model entails the, the set of formula? And that's what model checking is. You see we have all sorts of very broad, interesting questions, and then we bring it down to this one very specific one, which is given a model and a set of formulae, can I actually validate that they, they, they meet each other, they entail each other? And then I'm like wandering through this stuff going, okay, I probably should at least try to provide some definition of these terms. So in interpretations, our models, we have token sequences. Um, these are examples, actually. Uh, we have token sequences in, in interpretations that would correspond with grammars. So if you did any language courses, compilers, um, that one at least feels a little more comfortable to me. Anybody take a compiler course? I mean, there must have been some basic discussion about grammars at some point somewhere here. 
Computer languages are kind of weird, where you end up running into um, linguists and computer scientists in like these same conversations. You know, you st study Chomsky normal forms, and Noam Chomsky is this very interesting person. I think he's at MIT, um, who's been around for as long as I can remember. That means he's really old. Um, and we use those for a real world example, which is parsing. And so that's why I thought this was good. Okay, but database queries uh, or database tables are an interpretation on which we use SQL queries. And that would be can we prove our query executions are going to work correctly? Does the model of our SQL queries um, work with our database tables? Did we set our database up right? Do I have a valid data model based upon the things that I actually want to do? So you can see that, all right, so this trying to take something very weird and ephemeral and abstract as those last couple of slides are, which make my head hurt. Um, here we go. This is something that's a little more concrete. I did like email texts and spam detection. Uh, that was cool. Uh, letter sequences and dictionaries for spell checking. So again, we can have models for spell checkers. I'm like, wow, okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, speech recognition. So we have audio data, and uh, our mod models become acoustic or language models. So we know that specific sounds are going to happen in particular sequences, and we can reason about these things. Does our model actually work? Um, the one that we actually care about is the last one, of course, which is we take a finite state machine and some temporal logic, and why do we want the temporal logic? Well, that's because that gives us that non-determinism that we really want to reason about. Things can happen in different orders because this is where um, relativistic physics hits computer science. Different observers, different distances from the actual observed event. We end up with different outcomes. So we actually have to describe that in a model for us to be able to do model checking of it. And, and like you were asking before about the state space explosion issue, and that's exactly what we're talking about here, is that's our temporal logic. What the state space is doing is it's looking at different temporal orderings of events within the system to say, do all of those different orders that I try actually satisfy my invariance? Have I guaranteed the outcomes. The outcomes actually have to be the same, regardless of the order in which the messages get delivered. Otherwise, bug. And if we have a bug, we have to fix it. Um, this is interesting because, like I said, I took these slides from somebody else. In the first example, I'm like, holy moly, I spent so many years working with this. Um, when you build device drivers in Windows, they actually use a model checker a static model checker to see if your code is obeying the rules. And I know about this because we've spent lots and lots of times annotating things to say, here are the rules that this code has to work. And they had whole sets of, of specific invariants that had to be observed. And it would statically run over your code and say, oh, you've got bugs here. And then you put it in the compiler, and, and, and it literally won't compile the thing. It's, sorry, you've violated the invariance here, which means a human actually has to go and look and say, I know what I'm doing here. And most of the time, they're wrong, but I know what I'm doing here, and you can actually annotate it away so that it won't break the compile process. But it does call your attention to common bugs in sensitive systems code. Like, uh, you know, you allocated some memory here, but we have a, an allo memory allocator that doesn't block, it fails, and you didn't check to see if it failed. And it's really kind of cool. I remember one time I had a crash where something didn't check to see if memory had failed, and, and what was surprising was that it had failed 600,000 allocations and hadn't died. That's not bad. It was pretty cool. Um, and I fixed that one, and of course it ran longer than that. It was actually a memory leak. That was why it was able to allocate space. Uh, the spin tool, which I oh, it was part of the Smart Science Laboratory, right? Okay, uh, and that was used for all sorts of things, including flood control barrier software. Yeah, I can see why knowing that your flood control system was correct might be beneficial in the real world. 
um, call processing software, uh, Lucent was, you know, who owns what's left of Lucent, but Lucent makes telephone switches. When I was graduating from undergrad a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> uh, there were lots of people who were hiring to work on um, uh, switch, Signal Switch 7, which was the uh, latest and greatest software for handling telephone switches, which, guess what? We still run today. And that was, at the time, part of AT&T. Lucent was the uh, telephone switch part of AT&T that got split up and sold off and acquired and regurgitated. That's what corporations do. And effectively, we still use that today. This isn't like just some sort of imaginary sort of let's float around kind of thing. It's actually a real world problem. And we really used model checking to make sure that our signaling software actually worked correctly. Um, I've never actually used IPA, but it was one of the examples. I was like, okay, that's cool. And it's used for looking at multiprocessor systems and biological systems because these things are just naturally what I would put together. I'm like, okay. So these tools are real. They're actually used. And they help us reason about whether or not our model for the system is actually correct. You see, this is the, the flip side of that. And I was thinking about it from the biological perspective just now, is that I build a model of how I think the system works. And then I check it against the reality. And I can determine if my model is good or not good. Um, some of you may vaguely remember, but a couple of years ago, actually about three it started, um, we had this pandemic thing. And very early on, one of the biggest things was people have these models for how, how these, these pandemics actually behave. And it's like, how do you know your model's correct? Well, you build the model and you compare it to the real system and that's model checking. And you can say, well, this model is pretty accurate. Now, that's a case where we're not trying to prove correctness. We're trying to prove that the model actually describes the system we are observing. That's a pretty broad kind of use for these sorts of tools. But knowing that your model is reasonably close to the reality means that then you can make inferences from it. You can say, this is where we think things are going to go. But of course, it's only an approximation. It's only a model of the actual system. A model of a system has a finite set of states, a subset of states that we are considered as the initial state, states, um, a transition relationship, which, given a state, describes all states that can be reached in one time step. OK, so what are the transitions? Those are what we do when we get inputs. In our system, this is our finite state machine and our input, our log. The whole painful experience of Project 4 was getting a log that you can agree on so you always get the same outcome. And the model that we're actually checking, like in the tests that we have, which are using model, uh, model checking techniques, actually, uh, is to ensure that even when we change the order of events in the system, we get the same outcome. We do this for modeling and verifying software, digital hardware. Pretty much all CPUs these days have at least portions of which, if not the entirety of which, are um, uh, formally verified. We normally don't end up formally verifying the whole processor because the state space explodes and it's too hard to reason about. But we do individual pieces. We do small modules and we, we fit them together. And so we can do a hierarchical decomposition of our model. We can say, we know how this piece works because it's small and we verified it. And then we're going to take that piece that we verified and this other piece that we verified and this other piece we verified, and then we're going to put those together in a new model, and we're going to reason about that comp composition. And the ability to decompose our systems into smaller pieces that we can easily verify then it makes it easier for us to verify larger systems. And 
you'll notice that there's no projects that require you to do this because that's probably not a weekend project, probably not even a month long project. Communications protocols I've already mentioned. You can actually handle uh, infinite state spaces and reason about them. Continuous state spaces, continuous time, and probabilistic transi transitions. And often what ends up happening as you begin to broaden what you're trying to test for is you realize that you no longer can actually verify 100% compliance. That's why we test things. Too complicated, but we'll at least find the major, major faults. And when we find one that that we didn't think about, we'll go back and add it to our tests. And that's effectively what we'll end up doing. If you build real distributed systems, that is what will happen. You will sit there, you will think of all the failure cases, and then you will spend the next 10 years dealing with all the failure cases that you were not sufficiently experienced enough to know would happen. And then 10 years later, you'll have 40 times as many failure cases as you ever imagined possible, and you will start forgetting them. And then you'll have new people join the team, and they will find the ones that you've forgotten about. Models are always abstractions of the reality. So it's important for us to realize there are limits to model checking. That's why I said, you know, we're going to build a model. We're going to say, here are the things that we want to be able to handle. We're going to prove that we can handle them with some reasonable level of certainty. And then we're going to find out there are things that go wrong that we never even envisioned. So we have to actually make a conscious choice here. What are we trying to model? What are we not trying to model? You'll recall that the very first thing that we do early on in this class is say, we're not going to consider corrupted messages. Except we will consider corrupted messages, just not right off the bat, because it's, it's sort of like, imagine this was, you know, you, you were an architect and this was, no, you're a builder actually. And this is your first project. We're not going to give you a 90 story tower to build. Right, what we're gonna start you out as is a shed. Go build this nice little shed for the garden. Maybe it will still be standing when you're done. And you'll build bigger things and you'll get better and better and you'll understand more in your own mental model. That's the reason you take classes. I mean, frankly, yeah, I understand they give you grades and you get good jobs and whatnot, but the real reason that we use education is because it allows you to effectively build a model based upon what other people have learned. Your model will not be exactly the same as your model or your model or your model or my model. But we'll all have a model and we'll be able to talk about our models and we'll be able to reason about our models. We'll be able to use our models building these systems. You'll notice I have this um, thing where people ask questions like in Discord or even on Piazza. I normally don't give people answers because it doesn't help them build models. And nobody cares about the crappy code you write in this class, seriously. No one, not even you. A day after that project is due, you're gonna be like, <laughs> I don't care, I just don't care. What I want you to walk away with is a model, a strong model of what these systems need to do and how we do it. And, and I'll be honest, you take a class and you never, if you don't use this stuff, six months later, it'll be gone. If you use it, you'll reinforce it and your model will become stronger. And, you know, five years from now, you'll be teaching a class or one that's better than that. Pretty low bar there. There are limitations that are, are forced upon us because of our use of formalism. It's sort of like we started with FLP. We said, gee, we know we can't do what we're about to try and do in the rest of this class. I love that. I think it's a great way to start the class. Yeah, we're guaranteeing failure. Now, how are we going to deal with that? There are limitations within that formalism, and we are going to try to subvert those limitations as we continue to grow our models. Uh, sometimes we just don't have enough understanding. I mean, people are working on Project 4. Seven weeks ago, you probably wouldn't have been able to, you probably would have looked at Project 4 and been like a deer in the headlights. You do know what deer are, right? 
Well, not, you know, I realize not everybody actually has had a deer in the headlights kind of experience where you're in the middle of a snowstorm and suddenly a deer shows up in the middle of the road and you're like going, oh my gosh, and they stop. Well, the one that you see stops. The other thing that I always learned, as a, I was taught as a kid, is it's not the deer you see that you have to worry about. It's the one behind them that you didn't notice. Those are the ones you end up hitting. I know, it's terrible. It really is. But they do stop. Just like you. Just like me. All right, so the specification of a model uh, uses temporal logic, and we use some sort of basic primitive like uh, the states. Uh, we have switches, on, off. Those are Boolean. Uh, I'm reading from the, 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 the I'm reading from the, the tape of my Turing machine. I'm writing to the, the tape cell of my Turing machine. I'm moving the head on my Turing machine. These are all the kinds of conditions that we um, we describe in our formal model. And then we use uh, and or not and implies those kinds of logical connectors, and then we connect things temporally. Now, what's interesting is that when we reason about these, we say that, in fact, nothing is ever actually simultaneous. So we really only have one thing happening at a time. In the real world, that is really what happens. These things really can be simultaneous. But remember, when we are writing in that framework, the DS Labs, it is a discrete event simulator. It really does only one thing at a time. And what's amazing about that is, even though that's a huge simplification that doesn't exist in the real world, it will force us to still deal with a lot of things that look like they are happening simultaneously. Uh, let's see. So I'm being very general here again because this is the introduction. I picked somebody's introduction to a formal model or um, model checking. So the exact set of, of temporal operators that we use is going to depend upon the particular tools that we're using. And so that's going to circumscribe what we can actually describe within that given system. Uh, we can deal with the way that time flows differently. So we can have linear time. We can have branching time. Uh, it's really weird, but there actually have been computer, single computer systems where different parts of the processor run out of phase with each other. That's like branching time. It's not actually linear. And when you think about it, it starts to make a certain amount of sense. Um, I, you ever heard of Grace Hopper? She was a um, fairly well-known programmer a long, long time ago. And she used to carry around these pieces of, of uh, copper wire that were, oh my gosh, what would they be about 28 centimeters long, roughly just under 12 inches. And she'd hand them to people. And um, the point was that a piece of copper wire, that's, that represented one nanosecond. That was the amount of time it took for an electron to flow from one end to the other. It was about one nanosecond. It was like just helping people visualize that, that distance and time are, are closely related. Last time I talked about what happens when we start designing our, our um, Martian data center. I actually do like that. I think that really makes it interesting because we're talking about optimization of these protocols and it's like I would have a completely different optimization model if I really had to start thinking about things that literally took minutes for messages to propagate. Despite the fact that we can scale that down and say our messages propagate in five nanoseconds versus 500 nanoseconds and it's kind of the same sort of scaling as it would be like doing earth to moon versus earth to mars. Like, so it's scaling is kind of the same. So you'd think the techniques would be kind of the same. But it helps us mentally to say, wow, that's a long time. I'm going to do things very differently. As we try to optimize even down at this much smaller scale, 
the things I optimize for when I'm doing messages between different machines on the same rack of a data center versus different racks within the data center versus different data centers that are geo geolocated. Not geolocated. Geodiverse. Geodiverse, there we go. Um, and it's like, wow, it is really kind of the same problem. It's just a matter of scaling. And this is why it's important to think about that, is to say, I'm going to design my systems differently. But it's the same problem. It's just scale. Um, our actual systems are non-deterministic. What that means is that if we start at a given state, there are multiple different states where we can transition. So we can model what happens if we get different inputs. We can um, underspecify our system. So it's kind of a, a, a hand wavy generality kind of thing where you go, well, you know, I'm going to allow this non determinism because it simplifies my model, but it makes it a lot harder to reason about. And what are we doing in Paxos? We are taking a non-deterministic system and we are reasoning about it as if it were deterministic. In fact, we're enforcing determinism in a non-deterministic system. We're forcing agreement on a single linear sequence of operations. Uh, linear time versus branching time. In linear time, we just consider a sequence of paths. Uh, through, the, through the system. We can have many paths for each initial state. So we can ask questions of, regardless of which path we take, are there certain properties that we can guarantee? Or are there only a subset of paths that guarantee that? And if so, what are those paths? And how do I prevent the other ones from happening? That's kind of more the Paxos model, isn't it? Yeah, we could come up with all sorts of different outcomes. You could decide it's 42. You could decide it's 39. I'm going to decide it's 6. Well, we don't want those paths. We only want the paths that we all agree on the outcome. Linear time. Gosh, why did I put this in here? Let's see. Uh, temporal logic. So you have descriptions of the formula, the linear time formula, that say that you, know, you have different conditions that happen. So there's ors and there's ands. So, God, why did I put this? It's just all the different kinds of, of um, operators, operations that we could consider with temporal logic. In branching time, on the other hand, we don't think of non-determinism. Instead, we think of um, forks in the tree. Uh, there's this, this model in, in um, uh, physics, science fiction mostly, where we have the infinite branching universe, where every uh, every time there's a possible uh, difference of outcome, like is that electron in this this um, level or is it in this other level, you end up branching the universe out. It's very easy to think about that and to go, oh my gosh, that really does make it really hard to imagine or invent. But we're going to try and do that. In this case, that's sort of what this is. It's, it's the uh, branching tree model. We actually do use this in the real world. Um, did any of you take any... Uh, processor architecture style classes. So when we first start building processors, we say, you know, we're just going to do this in a linear sequence of steps. You know, input, state transition, done. And then what you realize is that sometimes we have to make, we, sometimes we make decisions about things. So what would happen in the old processors is we would wait until we actually have the data from the from memory to make the decision. Okay, so now I have a processor that, these days, a processor that can actually look at something in a register in 500 picoseconds or less. And so I can make a decision roughly in about 500 picoseconds, maybe a nanosecond. 
and it takes me 100 nanoseconds to get it out of DRAM. So I'm going to stall 99 nanoseconds waiting for that data to get in here. How am I going to deal with this? And somebody said, you know, we got enough real estate here. We've got enough transistors that we can pack down on these things. We could actually just branch and do both of them. Or we could keep track of what we did last time and use that branch. So we have branch prediction, and we actually have parallelism, where we branch out. And what's really cool is when it starts branching, then it can branch again, and it can branch again. And eventually, the actual decision gets made, and we kill all the branches that don't work. It's really weird to think about it, but that is exactly what happens in real-world systems. We really do this kind of branching model and then just start killing the branches that don't go where we, where we wanted them to go. Because we've got, it's, it's better, but was it the, the original reasoning behind um, branch prediction was it's better to choose a path that might be right than to sit there and stall and wait until you're absolutely right. And that's a good guiding principle when we talk about these distributed systems because what are we doing in Paxos? We're sending out things. We don't know if things are right yet or not. And in the end, what we do is we just brutally prune all of the branches that don't lead us to consensus. Same exact thing, just generalized. So we can have forking trees. Our questions do become more complex here. So, um, you know, have we, have we based on a start, an initial state, are there states where we can continue to make forward progress? It's kind of like liveness. Now we know there are limitations to this. There's no absolute solutions because we know there's no solution to the halting problem. Um, branching time logic and linear time logic can actually be combined. Uh, they describe the same kind of behavior in different, different ways. And you can combine the two together if you want. And so you have richer branching logic, which does, in fact, combine the two. Uh, all right, so informal semantics of um, LTL is uh, linear time. Informal semantics. So we have some atomic operation is true if it holds at a particular position. The and or not implies, presumably you have enough logic behind you to understand uh, what those mean. We're just using them in the same way. Uh, the LTL connectives just simply say that um, x of phi holds if phi is true at the next position. So in other words, did, the, did that state or did that formula um, hold, hold over? Is it, if it was true here, it's true at the next, uh, the next state. Um, F of phi means that it's, it may not be true in the next one, but it'll be true at some point in the future. So it was true here, it'll be true at some point in the future. That could actually be like consistency of our database. It's consistent here. We've got these states where it's not consistent, but we know that we're going to get to a point where it's consistent again. And that's okay. But we can now make conclusions based on that. Um, or maybe something is universally true. Hey, once it becomes true, it never becomes untrue. Um, we can actually have a, a transition. So we have some condition that's true, and then some other condition that's true after. So we have kind of this, this water, watershed event. We know it's always true up to this point. We always, this other thing is always true after that, and we can use that as part of a reason as well. There. Now you've Got a hand wavy introduction to formal modeling. Um, there's a lot to this. You can take an entire course on this and still not cover it. So don't expect that in you know, a 50 minute rambling lecture that you know it all, because literally you could make this your life's work and probably still not know it all. What is TLA plus? 
Well, now TLA plus, and we're going to go from the, this abstract modeling stuff into something very specific and concrete, and that is, gosh, we've got this tool called TLA plus. I don't remember what it stands for, like temporal logic analyzer or something. All right, so given a model for a distributed system, and this really was built for distributed systems, we describe the model and we verify that it behaves the way we expect. We use it for distributed databases and network protocols. D, like a e-value store that uses Paxos. Why do we use it? Because it allows us to reason about an entire system. It allows us to explore different scenarios. We can actually change some of our initial conditions and then test from that. Because of course, given the model, the model is fairly general. So you could actually change, where am I starting from? That's why we have multiple state space checks and whatnot, right? You know, you, you start from a particular condition, you do a whole series of operations, you check to see how things work. And search spaces are in fact used to extend the functionality of our testing. It is not a guarantee. The state space searching in the D DS Labs framework is, is all based on this formal model stuff. It's all based on this kind of search space uh, driven testing. What they're saying is, We've tested enough of your possible outcomes to reasonably infer that what you've implemented meets the model. So we built tests that are using formal verification techniques to make sure that what you've built actually behaves the way that we want it to. Why would you use something like TLA plus? It actually does allow formal verification. Gotta love it, I actually found something that's like dynamic on the screen. Um, it does actually allow formal verification of a given system using temporal logic. It gives you the ability to detect errors in your model. If you have a broken model, your code will not work. Guaranteed. If you have a working model, your code might work. Not guaranteed. It allows you to automate the reasoning about your model. It allows the system to check far more different possible states than you're going to be able to do when you're sitting there staring at the screen in front of you. If you've done this, then you have a higher confidence that the system you're building will work. Not guaranteed, but at least you're a little bit closer. Um, TLA plus is known because is well known because it has an expressive language that models complex systems. It does allow the kind of modularity I was mentioning before, where you can decompose things down into pieces, and it allows easy management. Having said that, most people don't actually write code in TLA plus. They write it in something called Pascal, which is a Pascal-like language with uh, temporal logic semantics that then gets converted into TLA plus and then verified. But people do actually write in TLA plus. And the extra link I put in the slides this morning, which won't be on the version that are on the website yet, is Heidi Howard's and her 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 group's fast Paxos implementation of TLA plus. Turns out you actually go look at GitHub, you'll find that there are Dozens and dozens of TLA plus specifications for different versions of just access. What are the alternatives to TLA plus? Well, you can use model checking, theorem proving, abstract interpretation, Petri nets. Sounds like I'm growing something in a dish, doesn't it? But yes. Uh, and Z notation. The advantages of TLA plus is relative to these other things, it's easier to learn. Um, expressive, scalable, versatile, blah, blah, blah. I sound, feel like I'm advertising it. Uh, TLA plus uses mathematical notation, which is both precise, human readable, and somewhat understandable once you understand the language of mathematical notation. We have state variables, state transitions, and temporal properties. Temporal properties are the invariants. These are the things that must be true. Everyone has the same log. All cleared states must be the same in all replicas, all copies of the log. 
If I read two different replicas, I must get the same value. Now, this is interesting because remember, in the real world system, we don't actually have a global observer. But in our testing environment, effectively our test framework is our global observer. So putting it into this deterministic finite machine where we can just stop, go get our consistent cut and say, okay, everybody's got the same copy of this thing is um, allows us to have that global observer that we won't have once we put this thing out into production use. There won't be any global observer. Then you really will be using logs to try and create consistent cuts to figure out what you did wrong. Um, I know you haven't done this yet, but I suspect that at least some of you will end up doing this. You will find that you often will have to debug things by using logs. And doing distributed log analysis is surprisingly complicated. It's a whole research area still. Corfu was useful because it created a single global common log that everybody got to use. And it made it easier to debug things. That's why Corfu is fun and useful. I've found in my own experience, many times when I'm trying to debug these problems, what I end up doing is I try to build that model in my head and say, how could I have possibly got here? By walking backwards. It's actually, have you ever you know, like done those puzzles where you go in one end and you have to come out the other? And I often start from the, from the exit end and work backwards because usually they're easier that way. Well, that's often what happens here. You have a system that's crashed, and you work from the crash point, and you say, how could I have possibly got here? And then you look at the state of the machine, and you go, well, wait a minute. That memory doesn't have the value in it that would be necessary for me to have taken this transition. So therefore, that memory had something different in it. What did it have in it? And I can reason about it. I can work backwards from it. And those are the way that bugs actually manifest. Temporal logic bugs actually manifest in getting you into a state where you say, where I'm at now, I couldn't get to right now. Because the state of the machine wouldn't have supported that series of decisions. So now it helps you narrow it down and say, aha, it's something around this state change that's caused me to be in this inconsistent position. Boy, if you can check this stuff in advance, much easier. The good thing about these kinds of tools is they squeeze out all the easy bugs so that it leaves all the really hard bugs for you to solve. Uh, let's see. Uh, composable, talked about that. TLA toolset, TLA plus toolset is the toolbox, the model checker, and plus scal, which is a higher level language that can be converted into TLA plus. And these are all on the Lamport website. All of those are links to different parts of Lamport's TLA Plus website. And there's a huge TLA Plus community. Um, anybody here use VS Code? Guess what? There's very good support for TLA Plus in VS Code. Just drop it in. You can start writing TLA Plus code, code right away. So there is an active community of people who really do use this. It's not something that I just made up. So in fact, here's a number of case studies. Uh, Amazon Web Services has been using TLA Plus for quite a long time. Uh, Lamport works for Microsoft Research, so you'll be shocked, absolutely shocked, I'm sure, to find out that Azure also uses TLA Plus for things. Um, train management was an interesting one. Actually, managing trains and switches of trains is can be formally verified and, and if you do that right then you don't have your trains crashing into each other. And that's a real world use of actual formal verification. You go, kind of cool. Yeah. You can actually save people's lives. That won't happen very often in computer science because most people will just bitch about the fact their web page doesn't work right. And that's not going to save anybody's life. Um, driver rider matching in Uber. It took me a while to track this one down. Uh, but in fact, because there's no formal paper behind it, it's just like some blog posts about how they did formal verification of their system for matching up drivers and riders. These are all real-world cases that actually have used TLA+. 
to prove that their algorithm isn't a complete, total buggy piece of crap. That's a very high standard, isn't it? Uh, resources and learning materials. I think I had some links to some of these earlier. Uh, I did link to the entire, to, to a whole family. I can't say entire, but the whole family of TLA plus examples on GitHub. And there are others, like the one that I found from Heidi Howard. And that paper, the fast, uh, the flexible Paxos paper, I absolutely adore it. I think I would much rather use that than um, MMC. It's, it's a great, it's very easy to read and it's a great paper. And she does really good videos too. So there you go. You've now had an introduction to formal verification, which you probably know almost nothing more about than you did when we started. And TLA Plus, which is this interesting tool that you can then spend more time on than you probably should. If you actually end up doing a lot of real work in distributed systems, it is worth learning these tools, for sure. It will make your life a lot easier. I figured I'd throw in a, a, a lighter lecture that you don't have to like go back and do a whole a bunch of work on. Because now what I've done is I've given you the tools. Oh, you know that, that, that model you were building? Well, here's how you could have checked it before you wrote the code. And if I had given it to you before you wrote the code, you would have gotten weighted down into this. But you've already written in your code probably, or at least some of it. And it kind of worked good enough for you to pass some of the tests where you said, ah, it. I'm not working on this anymore. And you moved on. Um, Got a week, right? Yeah, it's due next Monday. So you still have time. Has any, anybody finished it? That's because I cheated. <laughs> I have a reference implementation. I checked to make sure that the greater work. Uh, I did not implement it myself. I, I would love to. I've actually wanted to take the time to do that, but um, I need a reading year. Yes. You know, what was I doing yesterday? Um, writing C sharp code. No, it wasn't. But you know, writing C sharp code to talk to an Orango database so that I can actually get my research paper that I'm trying to finish for the 13th of April done. Oh well. Um, any questions? Well, that makes it easy. And look, we're done early. That won't happen very often. Enjoy it. Um, actually, things will get a little bit lighter after this because the next project is uh, kind of dovetailing with the direction that I'm going, which is, okay, now we've got Paxos. Now we know how to reach agreement. Let's look at a couple of interesting things that we could do. Like, remember we said early on, no, no uh, message corruption. What happens if we want to handle message corruption? That's what's called Byzantine fault tolerance. What do we do when people lie to us? Deliberately or accidentally, it doesn't make any difference. And from our perspective, we, can, we should be able to handle that to some degree. Um, we were having this conversation before. Remember those, the, the, the quorum techniques we were talking about? What's interesting about the quorum techniques and what I like about fast Paxos is that it gives us a way of actually handling Byzantine failures without requiring a majority vote, which is really hard. If more than 50% of the people in the room are gaslighting you, you can still make forward progress. But that's not the norm. You have to design specifically for that. It's a fun problem. Uh, the classic case of Byzantine fault tolerance is going to be uh, blockchain. That's the, the protocol du jour. And what's kind of scary is that when we're done doing it, you're going to look at it and you're going to go, gee, this is just Paxos. All oh, the algorithms are, look eerily similar. How do we come to agreement? in a distributed set. And it's like, yeah, cool. You know? um, in, in blockchain, you just don't, so the proposers, there actually is no leader. There are just proposers. And proposers have to be able to provide a ballot with a verifiable uh, result. And it takes a lot of work in, in um, traditional blockchain to get to a point where you can propose that ballot. And the first one to propose the ballot is usually the one that will win. But then we can talk about the fact that there are benefits to not proposing the ballot right away. Because there's money involved. And if I can get a, a head start on, on the next ballot, I can actually make more money. 
Yeah, it's fun. Blockchain is just, it's just distributed consensus. And I'd never really thought about it until you guys forced me to look at all these papers side by side. And I said, wait a minute, how am I going to do this with blockchain? And then I said, oh, wow. Yeah, we've got proposers and acceptors and learners. And it's, isn't it, with Byzantine. All right, have fun. I do have Zoom office hours at 1. If you have any questions or want to show up, you're welcome to. If you have questions, you can put them in the Gaza thread that I created this morning, and I will try to answer them. And if there are no questions and nobody shows up, then I'll just like stare at the screen and write C-sharp code. Okay. Right, because they're not agreeing. So, okay, so the question then is, are you having everyone immediately propose themselves as the leader? So the first thing to do is to choose a random back off. Or proposing yourself as leader. And so you, you could just simply, so if you introduce additional randomness into it, then what's going to happen is there's going to be, there's going to be somebody who steps up to the plate right away and says, I want to be leader. And if everybody else holds back, then that increases the likelihood that they're going to be elected the leader. And you don't really care who the leader is. What you're trying to provide, uh, prevent is everyone voting for themselves as leader and nobody actually voting for anybody else. Because that's part of what will make this take longer and longer. Um, and in fact, even in, in the original, in, in Pax was made simple, Lamport does talk about putting that kind of randomness in. I can tell it kills him because he's a mathematician. He's like, we shouldn't care about this sort of thing. Um, I can stop streaming. Let me stop the stream.